So this panel is called Persuasion, Inspiration, and Activation. I'm going to be your moderator, Claire Campos O'Neill, and I have a podcast about Texas politics where we seek to demystify this complicated political process, and it's called Go Behind the Ballot if you want to check it out. Um, so this panel will cover the necessary ingredients to bring someone from disaffected to motivated and how organizers can use specific tactics to make this happen within individuals and communities. So now we'll meet our panel. Um, I have Aaron Huertas next to me. Hi, Aaron. He serves as a communications director at Catalyst, a progressive utility data, data utility that maintains the longest running voter file outside the major parties. Catalyst works exclusively with unions, progressive groups, and democratic campaigns, and is the, fun fact, only unionized data firm in its field, which is great. Yeah. We love our unions. Um, next we have Lauren Baer. Hi, Lauren. She is a nationally recognized civic leader who has built her career generating social impact at scale. She currently serves as managing partner at ARENA, the progressive movement's flagship organization for convening, training, and supporting the next generation of candidates and campaign staff. And Lauren knows what this is all about because she was a candidate herself. In 2018, she was the Democratic nominee for Congress in Florida's 18th district, and she served as a senior your official in the state house during the Obama administration. So Laura's done a lot of great stuff. <laughs> and then next to Laura, yeah, we have uh, Yossi Sergeant. Uh, he is a he's the founder of Task Force, and he is considered one of the premier voices and most prolific producers of strategy, strategic cultural organizing. After commissioning and driving the HOPE campaign for Sen Sen Senator Obama's bid for the presidency, Yossi served the, in the Office of Public Engagement at the White House and was appointed as Director of Communications for the National Endowment for the Arts. So that's Yossi. Yeah. And finally, we have Sky Perryman. She is the president and CEO of Democracy Forward, a legal organization that uses the law to build collective power and advance bold, vibrant democracy that works for all people. I love that. So these are our panelists. And you'll have to tell us at the end, Sky, she has a panel at South by Southwest on Monday. So if you want to learn more, check that out. Uh, okay, panelists, so what are your thoughts on how we shift our thinking about political and civic engagement from something that we feel like we have to do to something that we're excited and eager and motivated to do? And also, where have you seen this modeled successfully? And we'll start with you, Aaron. Sure. Yeah, one of the successful models that I had in my career was working at Swing Left in 2018. Um, and we had uh, you know, a big wave of mobilization after Trump's election with the Women's March. And I think what made that program successful was that we gave people a very specific goal, flipping the house in 2018. And we also gave them a unique window into their agency with that goal. Um, so we mobilized a lot of people who were living in blue districts where they did not have a competitive congressional race. And we helped connect them to their closest competitive congressional race and they got to do their canvassing there. And the big thing that I think made that work was that people's uh, growing social identity as activists got them into Swing Left's, for lack of a better term, marketing funnel very early. Uh, it was groups that formed around those women's marches. It was groups that formed uh, to sponsor a specific district and a candidate who emerged from the primary. And it became people's social activity. Uh, and one of my favorite comments from one of our older volunteers was, you know, I used to spend a lot of my free time with my quilting group. Now I spend my free time canvassing. And it's, it's like, yes, that's the, your, your social activity has now been replaced with democracy. That's great. And you get more steps in than quilting, right? Uh, so, so it's that social identity that really got people involved. I think that's hard to sustain year to year, and the, the goals can shift over time. Uh, but I, I do think within that moment, we gave people a lot of agency, and we gave them very specific, useful ways to use their limited volunteer time that made them feel like they were making a difference with their friends and their allies. So I think one thing that's really important is to have a, a mindset shift around what organizing is and have that shift go from something that you do for your community to something that you do with 
your community um, because organizing at its best is a communal activity. And so ARENA as an organization, what we do is we, we train campaign staff and organizers, but we also try to build community among them while we're doing that training so that they have support uh, when they're out in the field doing the work. Because as some other panelists have mentioned throughout the day, this is hard. Knocking doors is hard. Making phone calls is hard. Doing it in an environment um, where you're up against uh, a lot of money and laws and individuals who are really sometimes attacking you personally can be a very draining thing. Um, but when you are in it with other people and you feel like it's something that's being done collectively, we have found it helps not only bring people in the work, but sustain them in the work, um, cycle over cycle. And, and that's fundamentally important because we can't just be bringing people in the movement and having them last three or six months. There is knowledge and skills that you gain um, and you become a better organizer when you are doing it year over year. So for us, that community building element is really critical. Hello, hello. Um, I agree with everything that was just said. I will only say that my hope is that we ultimately think of quilting as an organizing opportunity as opposed to having people check their quilting to go organize. <laughs> ultimately, you know, I'm a cultural strategist and a cultural organizer. The, at the core of that context is, at the core of that idea is uh, a principle that politics is where some of the people are some of the time, but culture is where all of us are all of the time. And if we're only talking to people in political voices and in political spaces, we're only engaging a small fraction of the people, read, they've been excluded because of sexism, racism, patriarchy, all the reasons we know that power excludes people from conversations, that we need to start expanding the way that we're engaging people and inviting them to participate in ways that they're comfortable, right? If two people get together uh, to go bike riding on a Saturday morning, they may talk politics and they may not. But if you insert into there a way, if you give them a bike spoke card that has public transportation policy on one side and the candidate's face on the other, they may actually talk politics in a way that's comfortable for them and that's an invitation to them that says, we see who you are, the UX becomes about the end user, not about me trying to push policy, but actually who are you and how do I engage you using what you care about as a way to bring you into the process? And there are lots of, I mean, history is littered with culturally driven practices, right? This is the role of the artist in society, the role of the culture maker in society, convener, storyteller, holder of history, healer, right? Challenging what we think, helping us dream past obstacles that we can't, when we can't see what the next step is, our artists help us make sense of it, right? We need to invite them into the process, we need to use them as cultural translators and put them at the front of our organizing process. I also agree with everything, but um, uh, one of the things we've done at Democracy Forward is to show up um, to the hard places where the really hard fights are, places like Texas, places like Mississippi, and to bring other ways. Um, we don't do political work, we do legal work, and you might be thinking, gosh, well, the courts are gone for a generation, but that's ex en entirely where we have to show up, is in all of these spaces. And so we have really found that communities can unite behind um, the ability to use their voice in certain spaces. So for instance, in Ohio, we represented the National Association of Social Workers challenging a local ordinance ban and an abortion fund there um, and, and, and got you know good results in that case. But, um, but you don't think normally about social workers uniting behind um, a lawsuit and being able to bring other tools that are not in the normal toolbox. People think about voter registration, they think about you know writing letters to the editor. So we're really trying to bring other tools and people find a lot of hope and inspiration and um, agency in that. We're working with groups in Florida, parents groups um, that are organizing around what's happening in their schools and in their communities. And we can provide legal tools um, in ways and we've seen that um, really bringing that voice and elevating and amplifying voices as opposed to having sort of the law talk to people, making sure that people are in that third branch of government, um, uh, using their voices has created good impact and can make people um, find hope, which I believe is the greatest organizing tool. Yeah, thank you, Sky. Uh, you're already starting to touch on this next question, but I'd love it if we can expand upon it a little bit more. Um, 
So how do you break down barriers that prevent people from participating in activism? How do we help people see that activism is for all of us, that politics is for all of us, that we all have to participate in democracy for it to be most reflective of our population? And Lauren, can we start with Sure, so I think that the first thing you, you have to do is you can't assume that you know uh, what an organizer looks like or who an organizer is. And you certainly can't assume that tomorrow's organizers are gonna look like yesterday's organizers. Um, because historically we've had um, a problem on the left, the same that I think we have throughout the society, which is that there are barriers uh, to exclusion, uh, barriers of exclusion um, with respect to bringing the most effective people um, into the, the organizing process, women, people of color, members uh, of the queer community. And so what we do, um, first of all, uh, at ARENA, we try to invite people in, make an open um, and inclusive space. Um, when we're training, um, we try to have policies around that um, that make all sorts of people able to attend. And that might mean a childcare stipend, um, because if you're a working mother and you wanna attend a five-day training uh, teaching you how to be an organizer, someone's gotta watch <laughs> your kids. Um, it might be uh, a scholarship, because if we're doing an in-person training and you can't afford to fly there, uh, you need a means to, to get there to do the work. Um, it might be reaching out and inviting people to come and instead of assuming that they will come to us. And then I think the most important thing that we do is we train the people who are gonna be leading organizing movements, um, whether those are campaigns or ballot initiatives or other civic efforts. Um, we teach them to have policies towards their own organizers that reflect our values. And this was spoken on on some of the earlier panels, but that means if you have organizers, pay them. Pay them what they are worth. Give them benefits and listen to them. If someone's coming back to you and they are of the community and they've been knocking doors in their community and they're telling you that the messaging isn't hitting or the strategy isn't hitting, um, give them the respect that they deserve. That's what ultimately makes um, an inclusive community of organizers and, and I would say an effective community of organizers because we are most effective in the work if we are sending people out who reflect the communities that we're working in. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I, I was going to say, and I think the earlier panels touched on this, but, um, you know, really harnessing this notion that we are the majority. The majority of people in this country believe in the promise of democracy and want to um, be in a society that fulfills that promise. And many don't see themselves as political, as you said, but there are ways to um, harness that, right? Um, finding the commonalities, bringing these cultures, cult cultural pieces in where fighting for democracy becomes part of what you do in your everyday. And we have seen a, a lot of examples of that, a lot of tools that can be provided um, legally and in other ways. And I think that that's the piece that we still, as a movement, um, often don't completely harness the fact that this is a movement, but it's the, it's the vast majority of the people in this country um, want to be in a democracy that works for all people, where all people's rights are, um, are respected. And I think develop, like harnessing that and really being able to, to talk in, in spaces that aren't just in sort of the, the more traditional advocacy spaces is incredibly important. Yeah, yeah, just to build on the child care stipend, offering child care at events as a default, making be, being the child care team a volunteer activity for folks who are, who are already in the organization. Uh, you know, I'm too busy with my kids. I'm too busy caring for other people in my household. That's a big reason people don't participate in politics. Uh, the other big reason is I'm too busy working. And the workplace is a great place to do politics if you're in the union movement. Uh, if, if you know your rights as a worker, if you have an avenue into labor organizing, uh, that's a great way if you're working 50, 60, even more hours a week. Yeah, you probably don't have time to canvass or do electoral politics or, or think about that day to day or even keep up with it. But if you can become active in a union, now some of your working time, it's, it's not just an opportunity for you to do politics in the workplace, it's also the ability to grow as an organizer, to be part of a larger organization. It's a great place for us to recruit candidates for office, right, to get that training through your union organizations over time. I would, um, that's a good question. How do you move people from disaffected to active and engaged? One, I would argue that um, 
uh, nobody is disaffected. People are pissed. Um, <clears throat> they may not be participating in the way that you think that you have bucketed in your brain as political organizing, but uh, everybody is engaged in some way. They're all touching law. They're all touching politics in some point in their day, and most of them not in a great way. Um, and they will all step up and get active if, if they are made aware that that is that they can affect change upon that thing that's pissing them off, right? And then the other point that I would make is is um, maybe change. We need to change the way we think about organizing. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I use this example. We were working with a foundation in California that was trying to raise outcomes for young people in two zip codes that were like the poorest performing zip codes in the entire state. And we did a mapping, a cultural mapping of the space, and. We started out and we, we took all the youth organizations, right? The like, I am, a, I am a, a C3 nonprofit dedicated to benefiting the outcomes for young people. And we like mapped their social media and, and how many followers. And, and then we like looked at their numbers and called them and said, how many people do you service a year? And we went and we mapped them all out. And then we looked at all the nonprofit industrial complex of those two regions. And it turned out that the two comic book stores in those zip codes had more followers on social media and more people going through their front door than, the, than all of those nonprofits together. And so we engaged a group of comic book artists to create comic books and passed them out for free and, and started to do events with the comic book center. And lo and behold, they were able, this foundation was able to reach a whole bunch of young people in a way that felt natural and felt comfortable and felt engaging using a voice and a messenger and a methodology that they were welcome to receive. And it turned out that they all gave a shit about the community that they lived in, but were never talked to in the way that they were expected to be talked to or hoped to be talked to. So nonprofits and our organizing infrastructure that we think about today aren't always the best messengers. They're not always, we use coded language and, and all kinds of wacky, you know, the child tax credit is vital and important, but who? The, what is the child tax credit? 90% of people and don't even know what it is. And how did that go away? It is shocking to me, knowing if, how valuable it was. But if you say, hey, I, you have kids, and like it's expensive, and the government wants to support you a little bit, like, isn't that great? People are like, yeah, yeah, I, I would like that. You know, <laughs> like, we just have to be able to break out of some of the, for, like, doing things the way that we've always done them because that's the way that they're done is like a really bad way of doing business. I love it. I love that y'all are hitting on childcare. I have two young children. I actually ran for office this time, almost this time last year, and I have a one and four year old. And childcare is a real barrier for a lot of women getting involved in politics. So the fact that y'all are thinking creatively gives me hope. And hopefully we can all collectively do more of that. So um, moving on, what are some common characteristics of people who become active volunteers or organizers? And what issues are you seeing that are mobilizing new organizers? Anyone ready? Yes, please do. OK, so we're seeing in communities in the, here in Texas, but communities throughout the country, that the extremism of the far right, the fact that you can't now rely on schools to have the books that your kids um, want to read, that there's an effort to deprive people of a basic education, all of this overreach um, that we're seeing across a range of issues is something that um, we, is bringing forward, I mean, maybe they were always, as you said, maybe they were always sort of advocates and activists in their own way, but is bringing forward a new energy. And it's incredibly inspiring. And I think that there is a real challenge to like those of us on this, like here today and um, elsewhere to harness this moment, because if we can't harness this moment, it's really on, I mean, uh, I don't know, I don't even know what to say, because there is, there are so many people that are using um, their voices. We have been able to work with Florida Freedom to Read, a group called Red, Wine, and Blue. I mean, so many groups are, are coming up and organizing in ways because um, the extremism is affecting everyday life. And in exposing that and finding commonality around that, may, everybody may not agree on the, the bullet point issues or whatever they said on the last panel, the sort of bullet point issues, but, but they're now such basic. There, there's such an overreach that there are such basic things that we can all agree on, that just the fact that people want to live in a democracy is actually something our movement gets to harness at this time because the um, because the far right is, is trying to take it down that I think um, that to me is what, what we've seen yeah I, I think I'd like to push back on the idea that there are common characteristics among people who organize 
people who organize are people who are affected by negative policies on the federal, state, local level, which means that's all of us. Um, I think if we've learned anything um, in the past six years or so in American politics, it's that um, we see policy not only at the national level, but particularly at the state and local level, having a direct impact uh, on our lives. And whether that is efforts to curtail voting rights or to limit gun violence prevention efforts um, or, or to, uh, you know, just affect the environment, right? Everyone has something um, that is touching on them and their family. And so the question for those of us who want to see political change is how do we activate um, that, whether it is, it is anger or, or discontentment or desire to make change that really exists in all 50 states, in cities and in rural areas, how do we take that and convince people that they can in fact have a home um, in politics? whether politics means running for office, whether that means working for a campaign, whether that means organizing and knocking doors in their, their own community. And so I think it's really incumbent upon us, the community of people um, who care about this, to open um, our eyes and our doors to the breadth of people who can potentially be activists um, and work to give them the tools and resources that they need to make change um, in their own communities and around the country. I love that. Giving people the tools they need yeah. to make the change is like, I say that all the time. Um, I'm going to push back on the pushback. <laughs> and I'm going to say trust. That I am willing to be organized by somebody that I trust. If I don't have trust that you are in it for the right reasons, that you understand my plight, that we share a vision, then I am going to be, I, am, I bring skepticism and I um, don't bring my full enthusiasm to the table. So I would just say the thing that I see across the board in, in my organizing work and when I see people step up and be effective organizers is that they are able to um, bring people along because they are ability, of their ability to earn people's faith and trust and that they are in it for the right reasons. Um, <clears throat> I will also, again, use this as an opportunity to say that like creatives in our community are bestowed a certain um, freedom to say things to us, right? Like I always use the same example. You know, Obama would have been fired on day one if he would have said half of the things that Chris Rock said, right? Like we give trust and we allow permission to our comedians to say things to us that we would never allow a politician to say, right? Like you are not allowed to talk to me like that, right? We're not even allowed to talk about that subject matter. You're out of here, right? We, um, we allow and afford our creative leaders space to convene us and bring things together around food, around music, around storytelling in, of its, in all of its forms in a way that can be a really effective organizing tool and creatives become really effective organizers in this way. And so I, I and I believe some of my, the, the organizers that I know and I think are amazing are really, really good storytellers. So in the process of designing and developing and organizing models to train and to um, teach storytelling, whether that's by poetry, whether that's in photography, or whether it's just be being able to like tell somebody what your life experience was in a way that's effective and earns you that trust becomes a really potent and powerful tool. Actually, I have a question for this audience. How many of you grew up with a lot of political discussion, family, school, kitchen table? A lot of us, <laughs> okay. We were probably, might have been socialized into politics uh, pretty early. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, my friends and my peers who weren't, I'll often hear from them after something really bad happens, as we've touched on, right? Uh, should I go to this rally? Um, hey, is it is it effective if I hit up my member of Congress? And I think we've gotten really good at mobilizing those people during those times of crisis. And we see this in the data, right? We score people on their propensity for activism. Uh, we score people on how much they demographically look like other people who are already active in politics and all the biases inherent in that. So, so that shows up in the data. And what I worry about is that after those moments of crisis, we have these times of extremely high salience. Uh, Women's March, we had three to five million people in the streets. 
after George, after the police killed George Floyd, we had 15 to 26 million people on the streets. And from a political science perspective, when you have that many people in the streets, like the government gets overthrown in other countries, right? And that didn't happen here because I think our opposition has gotten really good at deflecting our mobilizations. They've gotten really good at strategic silence. They've gotten really good at uh, undercutting policy from behind, right? In, in ways that are, are not terribly visible. Um, that's hard to deal with. Some creative stuff I think we can do as activists is to push our policymakers and our allies in government to give people more substantive avenues for their activism. So don't just you know protest me, sure, you're protesting me, I'm threatened, maybe I'll do something good in response and you'll stop protesting me, right? But what can you actually do with that energy? How are we inviting people into policymaking processes? Um, and, and I'll give you an, an old example I like from Texas, which is in the 90s, um, the Democrats controlled the state Senate and they wanted to do some stuff uh, to reform the energy system in Texas. Um, and they got the utilities to sponsor uh, what they called a deliberative polling exercise. And the utilities polled people, they selected people by sortition out of that poll like you would for a jury, and they held educational town halls with those citizens. And what came out of that process was maybe we should support clean energy a little bit more. So we have a ton of fossil fuel infrastructure in Texas, we also have a ton of wind. And it's because of that political compromise in the 90s that got Texas started down on that path. And it's because policymakers were able to invite people into the process in a way that wasn't super threatening to the policymakers. And, uh, and I, I say that I don't want this to come across cynically, but if you want to take a slightly controversial position as a political leader, it's often very helpful to say, well, you know, we went through this deliberative public process, and this is what the public wants. I, I think part of our job as activists is to, is to say, uh, not just how do we manage public opinion, but how do we actually help create public opinion, and how do we create more resources, frankly, for public engagement and opportunity out of our agencies and our legislatures. I just want to add one thing. And so what we've seen, and I bring this up because I know we're, a lot of folks view our moment right now as a crisis in the courts with Dobbs and, and everything else. But what we have seen in our work is that providing those substantive avenues, we represent all of our clients pro bono. Um, and if you have a voice, if your community has a voice and you're able to explain, so you know the medical groups being able to um, being able to explain to courts why vaccines are evidence based and why policies that support that are helpful. You don't think about you know people will show up maybe to a, a single lobby day, but they don't think about that these fights are now taking place every day, not just in legislatures but also in courthouses throughout the country because that's going you know in many places that's a favorite battleground of the far right um, is to go to is to go to court to try to roll back things and there's a way when we can provide and lots of organizations do this substantive avenues as you're saying in many ways um, talking points for people in their communities legislative work um, regulatory pathways but also legal pathways to really make voices heard it, it we have seen it we've seen it um, win results across a range of issues in very hard and difficult places um, because at the end of the day it is that harnessing of, of the particular expertise and experience of people that can motivate um, motivate change. Yeah, thank you for those answers. There's two things that really are ringing in my head, and one is trust, and one is crisis. And it seems like, yeah, they go together, um, that we have a trust problem, but when crisis happens, we turn to someone, and we want to trust some organization. So how do we build trust as organizers that we are worth investing in? I, I think it's just making a good use of people's time. Did, did they have a good time doing the activism and can they can they see a tangible result from it? Uh, I came up through climate policy, so I was lucky that the first campaign I got to work on was winning a fuel economy bill in Congress. And the people I was in coalition with had been losing that fight for 10 years. And you know, tears were streaming down their eyes when we finally won. And, and that was a big climate policy victory for the day. Um, I think we've had a lot of that in our communities, but we've also had a lot of loss. So we gotta, we gotta hold on to those wins. So I think there are a couple of things um, that build trust. Um, foremost among them, authenticity and truthfulness. Uh, people can see through bullshit really quickly. And um, if you're asking people to do something, um, you better well uh, be telling them <laughs> the truth and the whole truth about it. Um, and, and people also want to work for individuals and causes that, that they feel are authentic. People are, t are drawn to candidates who they feel are showing their true and, and whole selves um, on the campaign trail. And so, you know, that requires us not only to recruit uh, good people to run for office and, and lead 
organizations, but to, to create um, a permissive environment where we allow a little bit more uh, of that authenticity from our leaders. I think Yossi made a great point about the space that we allow for comedians um, as opposed to our political leaders. Um, but if you look at some of our recent political leaders who have been the most effective, I would say Barack Obama's a lot closer to Chris Rock than anyone's been in recent years, right? Because you were drawn to folks um, who, are, who are able to show um, you know, their true and authentic selves. And, and in terms of mobilizing outside of these moments uh, of crisis, um, to me what that speaks to is the need to show up all of the time um, and everywhere. Um, people get really exhausted um, when you show up only when something is urgent um, or only in the immediate run up to an election um, and then you disappear. Uh, until the next crisis arises or until the next election happens um, two years later. If you are present in communities, if you have built that trust over time, um, folks are more likely to uh, not just work for you, but work with you, alongside you um, for change. And I, I think that's ultimately what we need to be looking for. Well, I can tell you it doesn't look like an email that says like, <laughs> give me $5. because it's. Just can you believe what he said? Or spam texts. No, sorry to all the digital people in the room. It, like what we're doing, somebody, you have to take a step back and go, does this work? Is this working? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? It doesn't make sense. There has to be a better way, right? Like we have to have the like ability to step back and go like, what do we know works and what, what do I hate, right? I. I'm a political person, and I can tell you that I have like not shared a political ad with anyone other than the, like there was one last year of a dude smoking a blunt and burning a Confederate flag. Like that shit was hilarious, right? Like so, I sent that to somebody. But like, you're a politician walking down the street holding a puppy. Like I'm, I don't care, and nobody does. And shoving it down people's throats won't make them care, right? Like there have to be better ways and better forms of communicating our message out to people. The methodology is wrong. The communication message is wrong, and in, the whole UX pattern of it is, is is broken. And we have to take a step back and and figuring out another way to to engage people in this. Um, what was the question again? Um, <laughs> sorry, I just had some feelings. Trust. trust. Oh yeah, how do we build trust? Um, you know, at the end of the day, I I trust people. I, I I trust people around me who I share experience with. And being able to use the new tools and the new technology of self-organized communities that are have a pre-existing universe of trust that we don't have to start from scratch. I can also tell you that like standing up a campaign and then letting it collapse and then standing up another campaign and then letting it collapse is not effective, you said it, Lauren. An always on, ever present communication standard that says we're here with you all of the time and we're gonna and and whether we win this fight or we don't win this fight, when the next fight comes, we're on this journey together is is the right way to do this, but we don't have that structure built up. It's not coming from the party, it's not coming from, right each individual vertical of the nonprofit industrial complex, right? We all believe in each of these verticals, right? But this moment is calling us to talk about this issue. This moment is, talk, is calling us to talk about that issue. There needs to be the kind of coordination across all these issues that say, this, all of these values that you hold, that you believe are, are the, the glue that holds us together, that all of them together make a party. Or if, if you don't want to put it in the party sense, right? If, if we're having a C3 conversation of sorts, uh, they make a value set, and that value set needs to be communicated over over time, and not just around individual campaigns. and And we're not um, shooting ourselves in the foot by that that transactional communication that we've gotten so comfortable with, mm -hmm. and looking at that like power building over time that we really actually need. I'll say two things to um, add to that. One is um, I think harnessing the power of voices in the times of where there's not crisis. And I wanted to dovetail on something you said, which was we know that the far right is very um, 
strategic in how they treat individual people, the, ma the majority of individual people, in times where there is not a crisis. Prior to Roe, we know even after, I believe the polling said even after SB8 went into effect in, um, sorry, prior to Dobbs, even after um, SB8 went into effect in Texas, there was polling that suggested that the majority of people believed that, their right, that the courts were going to protect their rights. And this was after multiple decades of court decisions that were chipping away at a 1973 decision. There was never a court decision at the Supreme Court after 1973 that expanded the right to reproductive health care access in, that, in our country, but yet people were labeled as extreme, radical activists whenever they tried to engage in those conversations out outside of times of crisis. And so I think one of the main things that we have to focus on is voices being elevated, the voices of the majority of people, whether that's in faith communities, which by the way, the majority do not um, stand for any type of version of MAGA Christian extremism. That is, you know, that's a very minority group of people that are trying to, that are taking an outsized amount of political power, or whether that's um, public health professionals or teachers or parents or individuals, you know, yes, in COVID, nationally we started having a conversation about a child care crisis for years prior there were people that were delaying when and to have their they were delaying having families had foregone having families because they couldn't figure out how they were going to make ends meet and that was happening way before COVID and um, but when people would talk about that it there was then this messaging on the right and so we have to do I think a better job of finding spaces and elevating voices um, in the times where there's not crisis so that there are these alternative ways where people that reflect the experience of all of us um, can can be able to hold the, the, the conversation and the debate of, of the day uh, just briefly on annoying email programs in 2018, the, our movement kind of ran out of people who could do political email. So I wound up doing political email for Swing Left and learning it fresh and doing it for an organization that didn't know if it was going to exist after 2018 from a bunch of people who are new to politics and were happy to let us break the rules. Um, so we wound up, ha we, wound, we stopped asking people for money in October, radical step number one. We just asked them about volunteering after that. I had our field team basically co-writing emails with me um, to reach out to people in specific districts, and we coded all that so it was hyper-specific. And if you replied to a Swing Left email, we had a dedicated volunteer team that was just on email volunteer, and a real human being got back to you about your canvassing shift and any questions you had in like five minutes. And then, and then if you signed up for a canvassing shift, you got a little sticker in the mail. Instead of I voted, it said I volunteered. Uh, so we just tried to respect people's time and attention and their inboxes. And we, we were like all gas, no brakes through GOTV. Um, so we, we wound up asking people to volunteer over and over and over again every day. So it was almost like the bad email spam, but for volunteering. So we were okay with it. And if you weren't going to volunteer and you wanted to unsubscribe, that was okay. So at the end of that, one out of every 12 subscribers to the list, not active subscribers, not people who open emails, one out of every 12 people on a 300,000 person email list signed up for a volunteer shift. And I think it's because we just respected their time and attention in a way that other organizations weren't able to. And I actually don't know if you can sustain that full time, uh, but it is possible. And I'm part of uh, an ethical email group and political organizing that tries to advance some of these ideas. Yeah. Glad that exists. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So if you have any questions bubbling up, hang on to them, and we'll come find you. OK, so lastly, um, I'm learning that activism is a continual process. It really never stops. And when it does, that's when the backsliding and the retrogression creeps in. Um, but why does it feel like the left or maybe left values are losing right now? And what's the right doing that's that's having them feel like the winners in this situation? And and what do we need to to start winning the narrative and winning in policies and just winning all around? Go for it, Sky. I don't think that they're winning. I think they have an outsized amount of political power, right? Um, we know, I mean, right now we are seeing parents, teachers, individuals, people of all generations, I mean, from great grandparents to um, folks in high, you know, junior high and high school using their voices in new ways because they're committed to being part of a country and a democracy that's as good as its promise. But so I don't think that they're winning at all. And I think this is what is so in incredibly scary. And so then what has then, then what is happening 
is um, they have to resort to two things. They either have to suppress votes um, and voter suppression as a policy, um, which you all know a lot about for those that are local in Texas, voter suppression as a policy, or voter suppression as a cultural narrative about how they're winning so much and it's all dystopian and so there's no hope. Both of those things can suppress that type of civic engagement. Or they have to resort to um, institutions in some ways like the courts where they will try to reverse what they can win in the public square. They will try to reverse in certain forms throughout the country. And so I think um, that it's you know on us, like they, they, they may win ultimately you know, the, the sort of power game, and that's why we have to use this moment to build collective power because we know that their values are not actually winning over the majority of people in the country, even the majority of people in Texas or in Florida or anywhere else. I mean, we're in these communities all the time. We see it, and, you, you know, and, and it reflects all the experiences that many of you are having. And so it's really about like how are we going to build this infrastructure and continue to have play a long game um, that is not siloed, that is not part of a sort of you know rush fight, you know, not part of all these all of these um, sort of old. old tactics that are not working and how do we harness this moment so that's that that would be my view yeah I, I agree with a, uh, a lot of what you're saying there I don't think the the right is better at winning but I do think they're very good at controlling the narrative and they're very good at changing the rules in their favor uh, you take away voter suppression you take away gerrymandering um, they're not winning on any of this. They're they're not winning on it in public opinion, and they're they're certainly not winning on it at the ballot box. And so, if, if you keep those things in mind, um, on the left, we are actually punching way above our weight um, in terms of the hand that we have been dealt. We are winning in places where we ought not win. We are notching victories in places where we we shouldn't. And what we need to do now is keep up the momentum. Um, instead of retreating. Um, something that makes me feel good about where we are on the left is that we've seen energy and enthusiasm for participation only continue to grow after Donald Trump was removed from office. And there were a lot of people doubting whether that would happen. But I think people woke up to the fact that you know we were not fighting um, one man holding one public office. Um, we were really fighting a concerted long-term 40 plus year effort to um, hold power at the state, federal, and local level um, and enact counter majoritarian, anti-democratic policies um, that were actually suppressing uh, the will of the majority. And so when I think about um, notching more victories for our side, um, it is about telling this story of what we're doing what we're up against, and to the point that others have made, being proactive about it, convincing them before the Dobbs decision comes down that there's an actual very real right, uh, probability that your right to abortion will be taken away. Um, one thing about Republicans is they tell you exactly what they intend to do. There is, there's like no secret play going on here. They are very vocal. Um, about the way they want to change all of our lives and restrict um, all of our freedoms. And, and my sincere hope is that we have seen them do enough of the scary things in the last couple of years um, that we're going to work to ensure that those kind of retrograde changes don't happen in the future. I agree wholeheartedly, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> um, we're... We're Goliath, and they're David. Like, we're the majority. We're the big guy. And they are out innovating us. They are changing the rules. They are nimble. They are uh, they're doing things that we, wouldn't, we can't even dream up. And then they're showing up at our doorstep, and we're like, wait, what? The rug just got swept out from under us. Um, we have gotten over time, in a lot of ways, complacent with our um, positions of power. Our, um, our, we have, in some ways, our hubris is our problem. Um, the fact that we hold the majority in the value structure, we make some assumptions about the people around us and about 
those who are doing really good work that they're on our side. And the reality is a lot of the innovation is coming from across the aisle. And it is, it freaks me out. I heard the other panel that came up ahead of us, the Gen Z panel, talk about Turning Point. And they were like, yeah, yeah, that, those, those Turning Point guys over there, they're crazy. Gen Zs, they're all still voting, they're all still voting blue. Don't worry about it. They put $100 million into youth organizing and we put shit into it. You think that's not going to have future problems for us? You think that's not laying a landscape that's going to shift us down the road? They are, they are smart. We are doing none of that work. They are innovating, they are out innovating us. And I, and I know we have a lot of really big thinkers here. I, I just like, I'm light a fire, light a fire under your own tush because we are, we are, I, I, this sounds weird coming from the guy who made the hope posters, by the way, like <laughs> I am a hopeful person in general, but like our two sources of power have always been our people power, read unions, and our cultural power, read Hollywood and the arts and culture. And we have underinvested and almost lost both of those. And we are in a place where we have a very dispersed power source. And that is a great opportunity for us, but it's also a place where we are at like super risk. We have, it is, it is, they are outperforming us in culture and they're out organizing us on in the dark corners. I, I live in places like Discord and Twitch and Reddit, places that most political organizers don't like to engage in. That's where we that's where we play. And let me tell you, they are there. That pipeline is real and it is problematic for us in the future. We have to start we have to start using that 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 um, understanding that we are bigger to be a to understand that that's a threat, not an and an opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no. There's a lot of power there. So, uh, so Jane McAlevey, the union organizer, she has a book that has my favorite title in all political literature: "No Shortcuts." And in that book, she ha she has a chart, a wonderful chart. I can, I can share it around in my feeds. But uh, she talks about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. In mobilizing, you're getting people to change an outcome within the political system as it exists. You're winning an election. Um, yeah, that that's that sort of dominates the sort of stuff we do. In organizing, I, like you said, it's changing the rules, right? It's actually building power and changing how the system works itself. From my experience on the Hill and through other advocacy work, that creates a status quo threat to people who should be on our side, right? If you say to a member of Congress, like, I have some innovative new ideas for new committees and new policy inputs and different ways of doing things, it's like, cool, I will think about that deeply. Please come back to me never, right? But if, if you can convince them that this is a way to build power, that this is a way to bring more people into the process, yeah, that's different. The Natural Resources Committee on the Hill, they had a great program to help people in environmental justice communities who don't have the budget to fly a bunch of people to DC every three months to have virtual input on their legislation, right? Uh, so you can push for stuff like that. And um, our labor power, we have immense labor power. The Great Resignation is like a massive labor strike but not by that name because it didn't take place through the formal union power. So our union density in 1983 was about 20%. Now it's about 10%. So figuring out ways to formalize that labor power again, get that formal labor power back up, that's just not good for labor power in and of itself. That's uh, millions of more households where people are getting political educational literature from the unions. So that, pa that power's there. We just got to build it and we got to convince our people to fight on the rules and make the rules better. Oh, and if you uh, if you enact some chairmanship term limits in the in the House and the Senate, which Republicans have but Democrats don't, you might wind up with more Democratic elected officials who are comfortable going on a Twitch stream and know what that is. It lowers that average age. Thank you. Do we have time? One question. One. Qu we have one question.
the sun. Yeah. Um, so the problem you mentioned is very real, and it's actually you know three things that they are are doing at once. Um, first of all, they are recognizing um, the importance of down ballot races, um, very very down ballot races, uh, and are fielding people to run for those offices. Second of all, um, they are politicizing races um, that are nonpartisan elections. So they aren't saying, hey, we're the Republican Party. We are just going to look at races where Republicans can run against Democrats. Um, they're looking at things uh, like county clerks, um, election officials, school boards, races where you traditionally didn't run on a party line and are putting hyper partisan people up to run for office. And, and the third thing they are doing um, I, I don't want to say they are building, they have built over the last many decades um, a permanent on the ground um, infrastructure that exists independent of campaigns. A little anecdotal story here. Um, I ran for office in Florida in 2018 and I, I remember I showed up and I, and I launched my campaign um, at the end of 2017 and I said, okay, you know, where where is the um, permanent on the ground organizing infrastructure in Florida? Um, where are the folks for the state party who are out there registering voters and knocking doors? And, and the response that I got was, oh, well, we'll build that um, when the coordinated campaign is up and running. Primary elections uh, in Florida are in August. So that means the coordinated campaign was gonna be up and running um, approximately 10 weeks before election day. Uh, when we take an approach that we think about building this kind of local infrastructure in the months and literally weeks before elections, um, that's that's how we lose. And so it, it can't be like an either or strategy, like we invest in great candidates or we invest in, in infrastructure or, or we invest at the top of the ticket or we invest down ballot. It has to be um, both and, all of the above uh, to, to all of this because, you know, to build on what you'll see was saying earlier, like they're doing this, they're doing it uh, very smartly, very strategically, and they are banking on the fact that we will not wise up to how smart they have been um, and change our ways. Any final thoughts from other panelists? No? Well, then we'll just leave it there. Oh, wait, no, no, we won't. No, I, I feel <laughs> obligated to say something hopeful at the end. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, the question and what the panel was about was how to move people from complacency and inaction into activating. And and I, again, we play in a lot of spaces that are explicitly non-political. Like if you put a political meme in the SpongeBob um, subreddit, you get booted, right? Like you're not allowed to. So we are working in spaces that are explicitly not political, but let me tell you, they are not, they are not quiet. They care. They care about inequity. They care about pluralism. They care about uh, each other. Um, if we are innovative and we engage in the political infrastructure, in the nonprofit industrial complex, if we're looking at lots of approaches to tackling problems, if we're engaging at the ground and we're doing it creatively, and, in, and I would argue and you invite the creative community deeply into your work, we win, period, right? But we have, to, we have to show up and we have to show up all the time and everywhere and not just during the campaigns. Uh, quick plug starts with us, unionize your workplaces. If you work in politics, I'm an associate member of Campaign Workers Guild. We unionized at Catalyst through the Communication Workers of America. I talk to people about unionizing in our field all the time. Always happy to chat. And I'll just... Can I That's a problem. We need to fix that. Sky? Yeah, I'll just, just was going to say, um, uh, we have hope and we show up in the hard places. Our organization at Democracy Forward is a legal organization. We don't do political work, but we have seen how people and communities showing up in 
hard in, in communities that are facing really troubling times and in hard spaces like the courts has made a difference. We will be at South by Southwest um, on Monday on a panel um, uh, actually um, channeling the legacy of the great Barbara Jordan uh, and her um, hope in dis disparate times uh, for this, these times and talking about the fight for democracy. And if you don't have a South by credential and you want to join our community, we will have a gathering um, that anyone can join. Uh, and so please go to Democracy Forward dot org um, and you can find how to to find us at South by it's um x by x uh, s x s w um, uh, democracy dot org and you can um, show up and come to our reception yeah. and, and learn more so. and our panelists are st sticking around so come and meet them talk to them they're so knowledgeable thank you for being here and thank you thank you everybody for being here we appreciate it <laughs>